Secretary Yao. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. Maybe they will also turn it up so that you can hear or I can use this one. Okay, thank you. I think the reason why it didn't work was mine, mine was open as well, so uh, I don't know. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and it's uh, interesting to hear how you're talking about these things also in uh, Hong Kong. And I must say that it is, uh, I agree of course 100% with what Secretary Yao just was saying, greater prosperity also calls for a greater responsibility. That is exactly also how we see it in Europe. And I must say that it was also encouraging to hear that the relative efforts that you are having on the targets is now also being turned into an absolute target, very much in line with this. When you have prosperity, you also have to commit in, in absolute terms. So I wish you all the best with the many efforts. Uh, we can see that uh, you have challenges as we have challenges in Europe, and I'm going to talk about a bit about the European challenges, of course. And just to state it, because I know that probably most of you who have come here you are convinced that there is a climate change or you would probably have stayed at, at home or somewhere else. But just to state as a fact, because sometimes we tend to forget it, that actually last year, 2010, was the hottest year ever recorded globally, together with 2005, and it was the year ever recorded globally with the most precipitation. And all the scientists sort of warn us that we are on a wrong track, we have to do things differently, if we are to avoid that climate change will be a threat multiplier with increasing energy prices, increasing food prices, and lots of other consequences, both for us in the developed countries as well as those in the least developed countries and the developing countries. So in Europe we take this challenge seriously. We agree very much with what was said just before that it's a global challenge. But we also think that we as a developed region has a responsibility to sort of go first or at least go ambitious, as ambitious as we can. So that is the reason why back in 2007-8 we set three targets. Before 2020 we should reduce our emissions by 20%, we should have 20% of our total energy consumption to stem from renewables and we should improve our energy efficiency with 20%. At that time, we also said, and provided other major economists will also come up with similar things, we are also willing to go to 30% emissions reduction. We are actually on track to meet the CO2 emissions reductions for 2020. Even now, when we have exited the financial crisis, the economic crisis, we have reduced 13%, we should reduce 20% by 2020. We are on track there. We are also very much on track to meet our renewables targets. If all our 27 member states are doing what they say they are doing in their plans, then we will also meet that target. However, we are, strangely enough, not on track to meet our energy efficiency target. I say strangely because, as also Secretary Yao was mentioning, that is where some of the most cost-efficient initiatives lie. That goes for Hong Kong, that goes for Europe as, as well. So this is where I'll come back to that in just a minute. That's where our major focus also will be now. We tried to analyze last year, say if we were to increase our emissions from 20 to 30%, what would it look like? What is the potential in our different sectors? What would be the potential in different member states? And some of the findings were very clear that climate change is not just a about climate change. Intelligent climate policies will also improve our energy security, our energy independency, and it will also be a driver for our growth, our innovation, uh, the job creation. So that is, since last year, I would say that's sort of the trinity we are talking about in Europe. When we're talking about climate change, it's also about these two other components, energy security and how to create jobs and growth. That is also the sinking behind the next step we have taken. Because as I said, we are basically on track to meet the 2020 target. But some of you might be investors and you will know that 2020 is just around the corner. If you are making long-term investments, if you're a business person, if you're a pension fund, whatever, you are always thinking 
already thinking beyond 2020. So we started to say, okay, we have pledged internationally that we should reduce 80 to 95 percent of our emissions by 2050. That is ambitious, but that is necessary if the world is to do what the scientists tell us to do, namely to have global emissions by the middle of this century. Of course, we in Europe realize that there are strong economies, developing economies, that need to increase their emissions in the short term because they need the development. And we only hope that they will not make the mistakes we made when we made our growth, that they will pursue a more sustainable growth pathway. But we know that we have also up to 2050 to do more in the developed world than the developing countries will have to do. So if we should reduce 80 to 95 percent by the middle of this century, then we analyzed through a lot of modeling what would be the most cost efficient way to do that. That was the one prerequisite for the analysis. And the other one, we only sort of factor in known technologies. Not that we are not uh, counting on technolo technological progress, electrical vehicles, as was already mentioned, battery storage, carbon capture and storage, lots of things. But we do not sort of assess that probably there will be some fantastic technology nobody has ever heard of that will come and do the trade from 2040 and onwards. So we have these two sort of uh, assessments. Uh, it must be cost efficient and it must be with basically known technologies. Then that roadmap has shown us that it is most cost efficient for Europe to do 80% of our emissions domestically in Europe. Some of you will know up till now, some of what Europe has been doing has been done through offsetting, through the clean development mechanism, through projects. Nothing wrong with that. It has benefited those who got the projects and it has been a cost efficient way to go to where we are now. But in the longer term, we can see that first, it's not very likely that there will be cheap offsetting possibilities the cheap things will be done in these countries themselves, of course. And second, of course, we will also have to ask ourselves as European, if we want to make the transition sort of more fundamentally, how wise, seen from a European perspective, will it then be to pour a lot of money into other countries, some of them our competitors, instead of investing in our own transition? So the analysis was, 80% will have to be done home. The analysis also said, so it's cost efficient in 2030 to have reduced emissions by 40%. And then it said, and for 2020, we should have reduced at least 25%. So just mentioned, our target is 20%. How come then the analysis 25%? Because the analysis shows that if we actually did what we have already decided to do on energy efficiency, that in itself could bring us to the 25% CO2 emissions reduction. And that, that is of course also where the job aspect comes in. Now, uh, Secretary Yao was mentioning retrofitting buildings, and you mentioned that that is 90% of the energy consumption in Hong Kong. In Europe it's 40%, but that's also sort of a big bulk. And although we in Europe have been addressing energy efficiency, some of us in some of our member states, for decades, since the last oil price in the 1970s. And although we are, together with Japan, the most energy efficient region in the world, we can see that we still have a lot of potential in many different sectors. And the good thing, of course, about, for instance, retrofitting buildings and restoring pipelines making the energy infrastructure much more efficient, things like that, is that that is jobs that stay in Europe. Now here in Hong Kong, I will put it the same way I would do if it, I was in Europe. Excuse me, I would say that it's jobs that cannot be outsourced to China. And that, of course, is a very important thing also seen from a European job uh, perspective. And then we can also see if we're going to make this transition, it is not enough just to address the power sector, and industry. We have to include other sectors. Agriculture, transport, we all know how difficult that is, and then as, as I said, the building sector. 
Now, you know all how many difficulties also Europe have had when it comes to the financial crisis, economic crisis, member states having huge challenges with their public budgets and so on and so forth. You also know that on our borders right now in North Africa, we have many uh, really uh, serious events unfolding. Just to say that sometimes it's as if uh, the rest of the world think, okay, Europe can just continue this leadership role uh, without others following. That's not the case. It's not just a piece of cake to make this transition. And that's, of course, why we still think that it's important to pursue the international negotiations, to work bilaterally with key partners, uh, and to see that the rest of the world is moving as well. Luckily, we have seen that since the run-up to the climate conference in Copenhagen and afterwards in the Copenhagen Accord, where Europe before that used to be alone in setting targets, now 89 countries have set domestic targets. And among them, more or less all G20 member states, I think with the exception of Saudi Arabia. So things are moving. One of our key tools, and I will end with that, that is our emissions trading scheme. And also there we can see we started it for a test period 2005 to 2007. Then it has been sort of for real 2008 to 12, the period we are in now. And of course there also our industries could be a bit concerned. Are you doing this alone? Will anybody follow? And what does it mean when you actually set a price on carbon? From the very outset, the idea was to use the market forces instead of just having taxes where politicians can put up the tax or they can put down the tax, the latter happens not as often as, as the first thing, but they can just put up the taxes and you have no predictability as industry. We thought that it was better to create a cap and trade system where you do not only pay a price, you are also sure that emissions actually go down. And the interesting thing now is that New Zealand is now following. I just come from Korea. They have... Uh, decided that 1st of January 2015, they will have a cap and trade system. Uh, and the, in California, they are toying also with this idea. Australia is, others are. And maybe the most interesting thing is the Chinese five-year plan, where China now has said that they will make big-scale pilot projects in big cities and big provinces, Guangdong being one of them. Uh, to see, to sort of uh, get some experience with cap and trade. And the idea, of course, will be to have a nationwide system in a foreseeable future. Last year, I suggested to the Chinese Minister Xi that we should try to cooperate on market based mechanisms and sectoral approaches. And he accepted this uh, offer that we should let our teams meet. And now they have met three times, and as late as last uh, week, uh, Minister Shea confirmed that it would be interesting also for China if the EU Commission and China work together on some of these pilot projects. Needless to say, it's interesting if whatever we build up in this world may be not identical but can be linkable so that we, in the end, end up having what would be sort of the ideal thing, a global price on CO2. That is our vision, to make it expensive to be energy inefficient and to uh, make it cheap if you are energy efficient. The last thing I will mention is, now I said we had calculated what is the most cost benefit, the most cost efficient way to the transition we need. The cost will sort of be 1.5% extra investments, 1.5% extra of our GDP. That sounds, of course, like a lot. But there are two things. First, it basically brings Europe back to the level of investments in these areas we had before the economic crisis hit. That's what we're talking about. But the other thing is that it will more or less pay back in reduced bills for imported oil. If we make this transition, we can see that the reduced oil bill for Europe will be between 170 billion euros and 320 billion euros per year. I know it's big figures, 
Uh, but it just shows today how much money we are pouring into other regimes when we are importing gas and we are importing oil. Just to make the point uh, where I started, that it makes a lot of sense to make intelligent climate policies because by addressing this challenge that I think, that we in Europe think we must address, that we are obliged to address, address then at the same time we can improve our energy independency, we can improve air quality, we can see in Europe how much that will mean also in reduced health costs. Just to say there are many co-benefits uh, coming with this agenda and of course we also, very fine point, see it in Europe as a way to stay competitive in a world where when my children, we will be 9 billion, when my children are my age, we will be 9 billion people on planet Earth. I think there is no doubt that we have to create a more sustainable kind of growth for the future, also in the countries that still need to get a fair share in all the modern commodities uh, compared to the way we in Europe, in the US and other parts of the world created the growth of the 20s and the 19th century. So we believe if we do this, if we invest in this, if we really invest also in research and development, this is also and a way to stay competitive. Can we lose jobs if we are too uh, ambitious? Yes, there are many ways you can lose jobs. I just believe you can also lose jobs if you stay too hesitant when the rest of the world starts to move. So that is basically how we see it in Europe. We are moving ahead. We are getting our business and our member states and our populations on board. Uh, but of course, the speed with which we can continue to move is also dependent that we can show to them it actually works, others start following. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Commissioner. You'll see from the full room here today, in fact over full room, that there's a real hunger for uh, first-hand information on uh, the global perspective, so thank you very much for your remarks today. Uh, I'm going to hand over in a minute to Christine Lowe to uh, moderate the next session. I think perhaps we need to give leave to Mr Yao to uh, be excused at this point. So once again, thank you very much, Mr Yao, for joining us today. Could I hand over to Christine? Thank you very much. Commissioner, may I invite you to join us and also uh, Thomas Toby. <laughs>